during this broadcast, uh, we well, heard we a loud explosion, CNN, and we heard uh, ambulances, or rather we heard sirens. Well, it where, appears uh, that the planes crashed into the upper floors of both World Ch Ch Trade Center towers minutes apart this morning in a horrific scene of explosions and fires that left gaping holes in 110-story buildings. No immediate word on injuries or fatality in the twin disasters which happened just around 9 o'clock. Uh, New York Time and uh, President Bush uh, has called the World Trade Center crashes an apparent terrorist attack. The FBI is investigating reports that two plane crashes at the World Trade Center are the result of foul play. As no, well as the that they're they're the 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 and, um, and that they're investigating the into connections with Osama bin Laden. And over again. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. And no one will keep that light from shining. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. None of us will ever forget this day. Yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night. And God bless America. 9-11, I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. Uh, when it happened, I was in my high school. I was a sophomore. I was in my first period of English class with uh, Miss Joanne Garvey. 9-11, I was in the eighth grade. When 9-11 happened, I was uh, just laying on my couch in the living room. I was a senior in high school, um, and when it happened, I was actually in American history. I was sitting in the back row of the second aisle. Uh, when it actually happened, uh, uh, principal came over the announcement system saying that one of the trade center towers had been hit so every TV was actually tuned to the news and uh, our teacher brought in a TV and he he put it on there and everybody was kind of like what what the hell is going on and I I knew that you don't just fly planes into buildings uh, by the time I got to my second class which was uh, biology we actually saw the second plane hit the trade center the second tower uh, on live television um, within maybe 30 minutes or so, we found out that all of downtown Chicago was being evacuated, which was a really big concern for me. At the time, my grandmother was working downtown in the Hancock building, and the first thing that came to my mind was, is Chicago going to be next? Is my family safe? Um, a lot of the students were actually allowed to go home for that day. They brought in social workers and counselors for anyone that was affected. We had a few people that actually lost family members that were in New York uh, on 9-11. But that day actually was the day that I decided that I was going to join the military. I don't know if I would say that it spurred my enthusiasm to go into the military, but um, it definitely fortified it. It's something I had always wanted to do, and then you know having something like that happen kind of makes you reassess your life and, and goals, and uh, I, don't know, I guess it kind of helped like solidify where I wanted to go after high school. Uh, I'd been talking to Marine recruiters actually before that. Uh, one of my good friends from high school was in the Marine Corps kind of got uh, jerked around by that guy and I was basically deciding what to do next. I always, it was either for me between the Air Force and the Marine Corps and uh, I just hadn't gotten around to talking to the, the Air Force guys so essentially like when 9-11 happened I went straight to the Air Force recruiter. Um, but I was already in the process 
of enlisting in the Marine Corps. Um, we were released from school early. My dad came and picked me up and we had a conversation on the couch. And he was just making sure, you know, obviously before 9-11, I was joining the Marine Corps in peacetime. Uh, but he basically was letting me know that times were changing and that uh, with what would just happened, it, it's a little different. Um, but I was unwavered. You know, I was committed to joining the Marine Corps. But it definitely, it stays with you. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, unless you've lived it and you can remember not only the events, but your cognitive thinking and be able to grasp it all, um, it sticks with you. Right away. I realized basic training was different than civilian life right away. The moment you walk in, you realize it's gonna be different than civilian life. First day. Uh, actually, probably the airport, heading uh, in O'Hare, and we're all kind of, no one has any idea how to, or what's gonna be going on and everything. The moment I left my family at the recruiting station, got on that bus, went to the airport, it just hit me what was going on. And I looked forward to it, moving up to it, but I was just this, I wouldn't say there was fear, it was more of an apprehension. And I just remember walking off that plane, looking straight and having this tunnel vision and seeing that campaign cover. The drill instructor was waiting at the airport. We get there and off the plane and out of the bus and it's just, you know, yelling from the start. And uh, as soon as you get off the bus, you, I mean, you have no idea. You're like cattle, you're, you know, told where to go and how to do everything. And, and they put us in a line. And I realized when we are standing in this line, they kept pushing us forward. And it, it felt like we were cattle. They tell you, hey, everything that you knew and everything that you have done before is likely wrong and you have to you know, change out of your clothes, you put them up in a bag, you never see them ever again. Even the recruiter kind of tried to prepare us for, you know, how to salute and how to march and all this stuff, but it really was of no use because it was just a completely different ball game as soon as you get off the bus. The drill instructor jumps up on the bus and starts yelling at you, get off the bus, get on the yellow footprints. And what the yellow footprints are is it's basically these footprints in the parking lot. And you stand there and that's the first time you're in a formation. The entire ride uh, from the airport to Lackland, I was laughing and joking around uh, until we had two uh, drill instructors actually step on the bus and started yelling at us to go step on the yellow feet. And they say that the yellow footprints is the, the time that the transition from civilian to Marine happens. Um, we didn't sleep for like three days and I wish I'd have slept on that bus, but I noticed right away that it wasn't, a, there, there was nothing gonna be fun about Paris Island. For me, basic training was the easiest, funnest experience I've ever had. It was the most fun you'll never wanna have again. Um, at times I miss it because it's always in the back of your mind, but it was the most emotional um, 13 weeks of my life. As stupid as it sounds, I don't know, I, I didn't dislike it. It was difficult, don't get me wrong, but um, my father was in the Marines in Vietnam and he told me kind of like the cardinal rule to surviving boot camp was to like be, be a shadow. Because my grandfather was in the military, I have an uncle who was a sergeant major in the army and my middle brother actually went to the Air Force two years before I did. They prepared me for what to expect for the moment I stepped off the plane and onto that bus heading to Lackland. I'm serious, like I've been in Iraq and Afghanistan and that was easier than Paris Island. I was probably the jokester. I got everyone in trouble because I'd make them laugh, but when the drill sergeants came around, I'd be the one that you know had no emotion, was the quiet one. So everyone would be pushing because of me. But you know, at the end of it, it was a great experience. I loved it and I'd do it all over again if I could. I'm physically demanding, mentally exhausting, but um, 
don't know, I, I enjoyed it. I'd go back and do it again. But then when you get to the end of it, you realize it, it flew by. They have a saying on the island that the quickest way off the island is to graduate. That if you try to quit, you're going to be there longer. Yeah, I was really, really sick. Like, I, I could have, uh, like, gone to the hospital and be held back, but I just pushed through because I did not want to stay there longer than I actually had to. So you just have to compartmentalize your emotions and learn to just breathe, calm down, and just do what you're told. Do it as fast as you can and be as loud as possible. On September the 11th, 2001, our nation awoke to another sudden attack. We can be confident about the outcome the space because of just we know 102 the minutes of the men and women more Americans were killed, their courage than we lost in makes Pearl all Harbor. Americans proud. This generation, like generation of Americans before, in uniform, we accepted as every new bit responsibilities and we confronted and new dangers with firm as resolve. the generation that went to war like generations attack, before us were taken to fight to those who attacked us. Today. Like those who came before and those who share their murderous they are vision defeating for a dangerous enemies. enemies. Bringing freedom like generations millions. before us we and face setbacks a trouble on the path the to victory. And like those who Yet came before this all, war without always waver. have the gratitude of the American people. And like the generations before us, our nation will uphold will the cause prevail. for which our men and women in uniform are risking their lives. Like earlier struggles for freedom, we will continue to hunt down the terrorists terms. wherever they hide. And the enemy must be defeated. We will help the Iraqi battle. people so they can build a free society from the streets in the of the western heart of a troubled region. And by laying the foundations of freedom in Iraq and across the broader Middle East, we will lay the foundation of peace for generations to come. Thanks for giving me a chance to come and speak to you today. May God continue to bless our country. When I picked my job, I was a 1 in 6 X1, which was an electronic system security assessment analyst. Uh, it was an intelligence career field. It was my first choice, and I'm so glad that I picked it. I loved it so much. Um, it took me pretty much everywhere around the country I've ever wanted to go. I've been to different countries because of it. Uh, there's a lot of things that I saw that I wish I wouldn't have seen, <laughs> but uh, the experience itself was probably the best career field I could have had in the military. My job uh, is munition systems uh, apprentice from, from tech school, and we learned a lot about uh, explosives. Uh, a lot of it is safety-based, and you know, bombs and missiles and 20 mil and 30 mil and basically anything explosive that's in the, in the Air Force. My specialty in the Marine Corps, my job, um, I was in for 12 years. Uh, I was a military police officer. I ended up choosing 0351 Assaultman, which is a infantry specializing demolition. So when you watch movies, like when people breach doors and, um, you know, explosives, claymores, traps, taking out tanks, that's what I was specialized in. I can't really be mad about being deployed in the Air Force. I really got lucky being with B-52s because there's only a handful of places that they can land. Essentially, they're all alternates for the space shuttle. So I was on a tropical island during um, Operation Enduring Freedom and then extended when Iraqi Freedom started. And um, so I really was no in no immediate danger from, you know, like the enemy or anything like that, but my work definitely made it there so th that was uh, despite not being in any immediate danger outside of the explosives I worked with um, it was awesome we we had great things to do downtime they had a lot of people uh, MWR doing a lot of things to kind of keep us entertained because it was only a, a three-month deployment for the uh, initially and about a week before we, we were ready to leave we got um, extended for another four months and that's basically when Iraqi freedom started so we were working our butts off pretty hard. So overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan the infantry is doing their business right they're fighting the insurgencies. What I did as an uh, MP was I provided security for that base, I provided security for those convoys to get that those infantry guys their supplies. Um, whenever they had POWs, prisoners of war, we would go out we'd take the POWs from the infantry and bring them out and process them and interrogate them and stuff. Um, EOD teams finding the IEDs, uh, we would provide security for them. You know, we would be able to supplement the infantry and when they would take a spot, we could go in and provide security so they could focus on their job. 
Unfortunately, I did not get to do my job. That's the sad part about the military. They put you where they need you. So I trained as an assault man. I mean, I can tell you how to breach doors and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I did rocket launchers and claymores, booby traps, all that fun stuff. But when I was in, it was actually 2007 to 2008, kind of the tail end of the war, things were going down. We did a lot more humanitarian aid than we did actually combat. Um, you know, you get a couple pop shots here and there or whatever. But um, as far as my job was concerned, um, especially because we had the trucks, which were full of fuel, and you have extra fuel cans and stuff. You, you can't really carry demolition in trucks. So if I was in a, it's called a line company, the guys who actually walk around and patrol, um, those guys did more demolition than we did. My lifelong aspiration was to work with guys that don't exist. You know, everyone hears about the elite forces in the military. Very few people know what they look like, what their training consists of, what missions they actually do. And being an Air Force guy, Number one, I was one of two in the entire command. Um, I think we had maybe two dozen on the entire base of 3,000 Marines and Army personnel. And to be picked up by just soda was, you know, it was my lifelong dream. Wanted to go into the Marine Corps since I was, you know, since 9-11 happened, but ended up having to go to the Air Force. Deploying with the Marines and then getting picked up by a Special Operations Task Force. Um, I couldn't tell my family that that happened uh, until well after I was home. But getting picked up was probably the best and the worst thing to happen to me because some of the experiences that happened down the line, uh, a lot of people say those that have seen war never stop seeing it. And it's something I still continue to struggle with today. Uh, I don't regret my decision to actually work with them. But at the same time, there are things that I know I'll never forget. My time at Kunsan was, uh, it was interesting. It was really hard work. Uh, as far as the Air Force goes, it's probably one of the harder duty stations you can go to outside of being deployed for war because uh, we constantly practice war, uh, essentially, because North Korea is, you know, kind of a constant uh, question mark. So um, it was really hard, but you go really, really close with the, the people you work with. And, um, I, you know, I met some of the best friends of my life there. It's really hard, but you actually become probably more proficient at your job than you know any other chance you'll ever have. Iraq is different than Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the Wild West. Uh, it depends on what you did. It depends on where you were at. You know, Afghanistan is in its own beast. You know, you have Helmand Province, which is desert, and then you have up north, which is like close to the Himalayas, up in the mountains. I mean, it snows there. You know, most people think of Iraq and Afghanistan as this desolate desert, you know. Um, it's just crazy. It, it opens up your mind. Well, one of the things is that, like, hospitals and schools are supposed to be off limits. Like, you, like, can't attack them. They're considered, you know, like, protected unless they're used for military purposes, in which case then they become, you know, viable targets. Well, we got, um, we're building like bombs, like nonstop. We're working 24 hours a day. You know, I'm working 16 hour days. And uh, we get a, the frag comes down. That's kind of like the order for bombs. It's what they, what they want to load on the planes for a particular uh, flight. And there's inert bombs on there, which are bombs with no explosives. They're basically filled with concrete, but they still have the capability to be super accurate, like within three feet. So we build them and we're like, what the heck, why do we need bombs with no explosive that kind of defeats the purpose? We later find out that uh, there's like an area that's next to a hospital, like a road next to a hospital or a school or between a school and a hospital, something like that, where Saddam Hussein had a bunch of tanks uh, parked and so we were able to take out those tanks without any collateral damage to the, uh, the people that are protected by the genetic conventions. There's no motivation there. There's nothing that these people, there's no reason for them to be good. There's, there's no influence. So, and the crazy thing about Iraq and Afghanistan is we're not fighting an army that's facilitated by a government. We're fighting an insurgency. If, to put it in perspective, if what was going over there was going over here, the three of us right now, two of us might be good guys and one of us might be a bad guy. 
and you wouldn't be able to tell which one was which. And when we went into villages, we would be talking to you two, and you guys would welcome us with open arms and want stuff from us, want water, want food, and we would give it to you. All the while, one of you was the Taliban. And I couldn't tell. And then when we drove out of there, we'd get hit. They don't really do what we do. They don't have, you know, a, a set like uniform. So you're not like running across a battlefield and you just see somebody in a different uniform. Like, hey, that's the guy I'm supposed to go for. Um, it's all farmland. People could be carrying an AK. People could be carrying a broom. You don't really know. You just see a guy from a distance carrying something, walking towards you. And you just kind of always have to be on edge. So we would get them um, from the point that they were taking. We'd, after the, the battlefield was cleared and secured, we'd go out, um, grab a couple of them. We would zip tie their arms together. Uh, and we would put a loose bag over their head. Uh, a lot of people kind of freak out about that. Uh, you put a bag over someone's head. It's a cloth bag, they can breathe through it. It's just so that they can't see where they're going. Um, but we would put them in our back of the vehicle and we would transport them to our base. Um, we wouldn't talk to them. Uh, we didn't beat them up. You know, we just transported them from one place to another, made sure that all their belongings were together, and then we handed them over to uh, the specialists that would interrogate them. Um, Occasionally we would question them and video them and stuff like that, but nothing out of hand. Uh, the, it's, it's different to explain the culture and the personality. Um, when a bunch of Marines come and find out that you were a bad guy, these guys would probably have rather that they had just been shot because of the fear dealt with a lot of scared prisoners who shit themselves. And I don't know if they shit themselves to make us uncomfortable or just because they were scared shitless, but these guys would whimper and we didn't even do anything to them. They would just be sitting there crying. Um, but we would get them to the, to the compounds. And the sad thing is, is these guys were bomb makers and they gave up. They'd get into firefights and they'd give up. And we would pick them up, have all the evidence in the world uh, that these guys were bad guys. And they would get to the interrogation, and then the interrogators and stuff would find out that these guys were just peons, that they weren't the high level targets. So they would release them. So we either kill them or we capture them and release them to kill them another day. I don't know why that is. It kind of pisses you off. A lot of what we did, like I said, rural areas, um, it's dry, and water is hard to come by, so people like the sheikhs, the local mayors of different like areas of the community, you'd have to work with to try to get, oh, this guy's got more water than this guy does, or we would dig like irrigation canals and stuff like that to get, make sure that either kids by the schools had kind of like canals that they can swim in and play in, even though they were meant for irrigation reasons and, uh, and farming, but the way it is in Iraq, they, you know, don't have a lot so something like that to a kid is like oh hey I can go you know play in this canal and it's not super dirty and super gross um, a lot of the finding caches and getting rid of them making sure there's no like mines or unexploded ordnance that are just laying around that could harm somebody so it was a lot of it was like clean up from some really old stuff desert storm and some some really really earlier um, conflicts and then a lot of it was just humanitarian setting up schools and uh, stuff like that so this is what I think they called A-Day. It was the first day of the Iraqi Freedom War. And during my three-month deployment, my great-uncle, my grandmother's brother, uh, died. And he was in the Army during World War, or not World War, uh, sorry, Vietnam. And uh, he was never quite the same. And he ended up uh, passing away uh, on that deployment. And uh, we were kind of in the middle of war, and a new one was about to start. So I, there was no way I could go home unless it was immediate family member. So uh, passed away in Missouri. And what happens is, is uh, different, or around the country, different regions have different honor guard, um, uh, I guess branches or units that, that will travel over 
certain number of uh, miles or square miles or whatever, and anything within that they'll do. Well, uh, so the closest detachment to where my uncle passed away was from Whiteman Air Force Base uh, in Missouri. And it turns out uh, a lot of the guys we got were from Whiteman Air Force Base. And so, can't really see him here. Uh, his name is Marcus Hunter. Uh, he actually performed my uncle's uh, burial rites and honor guard uh, thing, or on a ceremony. And he's actually from Chicago too. And uh, so I was like, we, we, somehow it came up and he was saying he was an honor guard where he's from. And I was like, oh, you know, you may have done my, my uncle's. And he's like, you know, I, I told him his name and, and all that. And he's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did that one. And I was like, well, my mom said she gave all you guys a hug. And she's like, oh, I remember her. Like, because my mom is, she is definitely a hugger. And everyone was, you know, thanking her and, or thanking them and, and, uh, and all that good stuff, but it was really cool. He still, we still talk every now and then on, on Facebook, because he's also out. I think he lives in Northwestern Indiana now, but he's a really good dude. You will feel no bond when you shake a 90-year-old man's hand who's wearing his little blue hat that says Guadalcanal or something like that. You'll feel no, no stronger bond when you shake his hand and you realize that this guy's 90 years old and here I am, 30, but he's my brother, and it's just a link. The only bond I can compare it to, I mean, is fatherhood, but it's just amazing. I don't know anywhere would you, where you would find, you know, that big of a generation gap to embrace each other. The camaraderie, I guess, uh, of being with the same people, you know, day in and day out is what you remember. I actually terrible cook going into the military. You wouldn't think in the military you'd learn how to cook, but uh, I had a buddy from Texas who, who taught me how to, how to like grill and just, it sounds stupid, but um, we didn't have a grill. We didn't have a lot of stuff. So our grill was actually an old, like probably about yay big around um, like wash tub made out of metal. We just fill it up with wood and we cut a, a chicken wire fence up and put it on top of there. So that way we could, instead of having like these crummy meat patties that we would throw in the microwave and eat, we could actually like grill and kind of make it feel like it's home. Just being there, just being with the people that I know, the people that I met, um, the biggest thing I can take away from the Marine Corps is the brothers I made, the, the relationships I made. I can pick up the phone right now and give someone a call that I haven't talked to in 10 years and we could sit and shoot the shit like we just talked to each other yesterday. Um, it's crazy. If I could go back to Iraq in 2004 and live in the same shitty tent that I did for six months with shitty AC, with shitty food, and be with those same 13, 14 guys, I would take it any day just to be there. You immediately miss it. And I don't, uh, and sometimes you hate the Marine Corps and you, 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 you kind of are like, man, I got to do this stuff. and. Um, you're like, I just can't wait to get out. Uh, and then when you get out, you're like, man, I just wish I was back in there. Grim statistics, as more soldiers are killing themselves than are dying in battle. I can still see her. Soldiers I mean, are part like, of a it never goes away. Of GIs who he had are already been deployed for Iraq and Afghanistan. PTSD. And he was suffering symptoms of severe post-traumatic stress disorder. The military seems um, to had a really him, lasting impact on him. It was very, very Banks, troubling. He said he still has nightmares about it. Problem, and while in Afghanistan, he also saw a really horrible thing. He saw comrades from his unit die right in front of him. So in my conversations, I've just really found that he's been through a whole lot. It was hard to come to terms with that, you know, something I was involved in was something so traumatic and I didn't talk about it for over a year and it got to the point where it was just too much to handle but leaving Iraq I knew when I got on that plane back to Kuwait and then back to the States that my life was going to be changed forever. My worst memory from the time in service. Worst memory from time in service is when people are killed.
That's it. And what I found was I was using alcohol to try to get away from the nightmares that I, you know, started to surface, but it only made it worse. So I decided to not go to sleep. So I would stay up for several days at a time. Uh, and my unit started to notice that while on flying some of these missions, you know, I would lose track of what I was doing. I'd lose focus. I'd miss call outs. Um, they didn't know to the extent of what was happening uh, in my personal life. You know, they had no idea that I was even in Iraq or what I did, so I couldn't talk to anyone there. What I thought would be easy to get through just by drinking turned into a bigger problem, uh, both at work and with my personal life. And in April, uh, things just blew up. Me and my wife ended up having to be separated. The military stepped in. Uh, we were living on base at the time, so my unit found out what was going on. And they told me I couldn't live in my house because with the drinking and everything going on, they felt my son's safety was in danger. And ended up making me live on base in one of the dorms which is maybe a bedroom and a bathroom and a small closet. So I've gone from a house to something smaller than, you know, the size of a college dorm room. Uh, wasn't really happy about it. I didn't have a choice, you know, where I could stay. So I actually found myself ghosting, which is you make it look like you're living in the room. I was actually staying with one of my motorcycle friends. I stayed at his house the entire time. And the way the my unit in Nevada started handling things only made the situation worse for me. After everything had started building up, in late June, um, I actually suffered my first blackout. I drove to work, I was on mids, so I got to work at about 11.30. Uh, went to our daily brief. I had talked to the active first sergeant, Master Sergeant Winkleman, uh, and he pretty much told me he still didn't know when I'd be able to see my son. That's the last thing I remember for two days. Uh, when I actually did come to, I had driven from Nevada to Chicago straight through. Uh, don't remember it, how it happened. They told me I used my government military uh, travel card. I withdrew $500. I emptied out my personal bank account. Um, I disassembled my phone so they couldn't track me. Um, and I showed up at my mom's house. I ended up getting sent to Heinz VA Hospital, a uh, psychiatric unit. I was there for about a week until the military actually came and got me. They flew me back to Nevada and I ended up in my first treatment center. When I was there, I was there for about five days. That was the first time I found out what I was actually dealing with. You know, they actually diagnosed me there with PTSD. Um, I was there for about a week and I got released right after the 4th of July. And I don't remember it. Um, I'd been reacting really bad to some of the medications they put me on. And Master Sergeant Johnson was back and she drove me on base to pick up my meds. They had given me a month's supply of three different medications and something for sleep. I went back to the friend's house that I was staying with and from what I've been told, I ended up taking a hundred sleeping pills that I've gotten. That was my first suicide attempt. Uh, his girlfriend actually found me in the bed unconscious. Uh, she actually drove me herself to the hospital on base. Uh, when she pulled up, I wasn't breathing. Uh, they got me into the emergency room, took my dog tag because by that point, my heart had stopped. So they ended up reviving me after about four minutes. They called my mom and she somehow got to Vegas in like 12 hours. And I don't remember any of it. And when I woke up the next week out of my coma, I was in another treatment facility. I was in a Spring Mountain. And my unit had told me I'd be there for about a week. And I was there for three and a half months. And when I was there, you know, they wouldn't tell me what was going on. They wouldn't talk to my family. And my mom, actually, she's been chief of staff in Aurora at the Ottoman's office for several years now, so she has connections with, you know, state officials, governors, mayors, uh, house reps, senators. So she called the center in Nevada. 
who contacted the military and told them that he was launching an investigation. And when that happened, my commander, my first sergeant, my supervisor, my flight chief all showed up at the hospital with the JAG officer, the judge advocate, which is like a lawyer for the military, and asked me to sign a document saying that they wouldn't release information for the, uh, the senator's request and that they wouldn't talk to the media because at this point my mom had gotten the media involved because of what was going on. And they told me that, you know, if I signed it, you know, once I got out, you know, they'd do an assessment and I'd be able to go back on flying status, I'd be able to see my son again. I felt like they were lying, which they were. So I told them I wasn't going to sign it. Uh, my mom had actually called in another lawyer who came with my unit leadership. And I told them I wasn't going to sign it, so I actually signed the opposite line saying I wanted all the documents released. And my unit was furious because now they had to let the government, the state government, come into and see what they were doing and how they were treating things. And they went back through the history and found out that everything that my unit had done to make the situation worse, how they weren't helping when I reached out for help. And, you know, it wasn't the first time that I'd be in that hospital because of the military. I actually ended up going back two more times because of that. Um, but the military just tried to silence me and didn't want anyone to know what was going on inside that unit and I refused to let that happen. Probably when I decided to get out of the military, um, that was pretty much my worst moment. I, I, I never really expected to get out. Um, we were, in my job, held at such a high standard where if we make mistakes, we could die because it's explosives or our friends could die or you know the bomb doesn't go off and kill the people who it's supposed to and then our boys die, die down range so um, we basically can't make any mistakes and what, uh, what ended up happening was when I got my orders to Korea um, I was told that uh, I couldn't get a follow-on assignment which I usually you get before and that's kind of the reason you choose to go to uh, Korea because you can't kind of get to pick where you go next, which is, I mean, there's tons of places around the world you can go, so it's pretty awesome. So I couldn't get a follow-on assignment unless I extended, but uh, the people in extensions told me that I couldn't extend without a follow-on assignment, and I was just like, I don't want any more of this. Like, if I'm held to such a standard and, you know, there's a few guys that are too lazy to do their job, I can't say that they all were like that, but in that instance, it, it really stunk, and I was just, that was kind of like my straw that broke the camel's back, and that uh, sent me out. So unfortunately, I was just in the wrong MOS at the wrong time where they stopped promoting. And in the Marine Corps, you have to hit certain ranks to move on, to be able to stay in. So I was peaked. Um, my MOS wasn't promoting, so I had to get out. And I just decided um, I was kind of sick and tired of um, the politics of it, I guess. Like I said, the, the infantry side of thing was nice and fun, and you got to, you know, you PT, you're hanging out with your friends, you're going to the ranges, you're shooting, you're doing all the stuff that you kind of signed up and trained for. But when you, go, when you get into that, that whole other side of thing, being in the admin world, um, I couldn't deal with the, the I'm always right because I'm a higher rank and you don't know what you're talking about because you're stupid. And, um, it was a lot of it was just the politics of I've been around longer Do it my way and just because you do something wrong for 20 years doesn't mean it's the right thing to do I think going from the military environment uh, To civilian environments pretty difficult uh, it, do, it probably doesn't seem like it But when you go from such a structured environment and especially knowing all the things that you're expected to do and how you're expected to behave and you know, look and dress and, and all that stuff, going to a more chaotic, free, I guess, I don't even know if that's the right word, uh, can be kind of difficult. Um, it's hard. It's a lot harder than people tell you. And it might be different. You know, basically being around people my age and partying a lot and, and uh, you know, kind of doing whatever I want. I now have a different kind of responsibility that was just difficult to get used to. When you get out after four years and you're, you're single, you can go to school. You can do whatever you want. You can get an entry level job um, and put in the time. When you get out of the Marine Corps after 12 years and you have a resume, you know, not just I was a military police officer, but 
I moved up the ranks. I've got all these certificates. I was in charge of people. I have leadership. But none of that means anything in the civilian world. No one gives a shit what you did in the Marine Corps. I decided to go back to college, and I initially started back with computer science, which was my original major in 2004. But it didn't appeal to me anymore. I would always grown up around computers. I can put a computer together, tear it apart, build programs, no problem. But after being over there and, you know, suffering two suicide attempts myself, losing a really close friend to suicide, uh, we lost actually another two people after him from my home unit to suicide. Um, my goal has been to help people navigate PTSD, mental illness, you know, substance abuse disorder. So I decided to go into social work. And since doing that, it's probably been the most rewarding thing I've ever done, you know, talking with other veterans from different locations, different schools, even within the VA itself, you know, being able to know that one day I'll be able to help and give back. Uh, I had great caretakers while being enrolled at the VA uh, that taught me a lot of things, something I actually want to be able to give back to my brothers and sisters. Uh, I decided to go back to college before I got out of the military. I just had no clue on what I wanted to do. I was still kind of in the same position I was before I joined the military. Obviously being a bomb builder is not something that's really uh, big in the civilian world. So um, I kind of had to take some time and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I narrowed it down to somewhere in the sciences. And so I went to College of DuPage and kind of tested the waters of a lot of different things. I chose uh, the biology in the PA school um, because I feel like I can make a difference. I don't want a job where I'm um, you know, behind the scenes. I kind of like, I'm, I'm a hands-on person and I uh, enjoy being around people. And uh, the VA is kind of my obviously obvious choice because I look at those people like they're my family, uh, like the brotherhood, or, you know, brothers and sisters in arms. and. To me, that would make a job feel less like work and, and more like uh, helping family, and I figured that was important to me. I wanted to get back into law enforcement. I started pursuing my degree because I don't want to be satisfied with just staying somewhere. Um, I want to be able to move up. So I saw it as, as that opportunity, to increase the opportunity um, and advancement, professional development, um, and just become more well-rounded. So when I came here, I finished my bachelor's or was anticipating finishing my bachelor's and I was still gonna have money left on my GI Bill. So um, I wasn't even thinking about a master's program, honestly, I was gonna graduate um, and just kinda go start working and then maybe come back to higher education later. But um, my final year here, they, they're like, hey, we're starting up a, a graduate program in chemistry. And I was like, already doing uh, research for Dr. Kelleher and uh, decided to try my hand at it and see where it goes. So I came to view the campus. Um, you know, it was pretty nice, but the selling point for me was meeting Roman. Uh, he's actually our director of uh, Veterans Affairs and Outreach here. You know, since being here the past few years, me and him have grown really close. Uh, you know, me and my wife came to visit. We thought, you know, we'd be here for an hour. We were here speaking with Roman doing a campus tour for about three hours. And, you know, hearing how much that he was involved with the student veterans here, you know, with Student Veterans of America chapter that we have here, everything that he does for the veterans, you know, the, the cadets here, their families that are using benefits, you know, it was something, it gave me that sense of family that I had in the military, and that's something I always wanted to have with me no matter where I went. Uh, I chose Lewis because it's, uh, I saw the billboards uh, that it's uh, military friendly and actually kind of my girlfriend pushed me like, hey, you need to check this out, it's military friendly and I, at the time I honestly had no idea what that meant, uh, but it definitely, uh, I would say, is military friendly. There's like almost every, every class I have, there's other, other veterans in it and it certainly makes a difference for me. Obviously I chose Lewis because it's one of the better schools in the country for veterans. Um, it's close to home. I like it, it's a small school, I like the classes, you know, you don't really have a lot of people. It's good interaction, it's a really good school. Decided to just look in the area for veteran friendly schools that accepted, you know, the, the post 9-11 GI Bill, which is great because it you know, covers all my education. Um, also Lewis is a yellow ribbon school, which means anything that's not covered by the GI Bill, the school is also gonna take care of for you. So it makes it really, really easy to transition from, you know, 
what am I going to do? You know, I have a house, I have a mortgage, I have, uh, you know, my wife. I was kind of working at the time, um, just odd jobs here and there. And uh, it was nice to to have a school that was willing to offset the financial burden of things. A lot of veterans are non-traditional students. You know, we serve, you know, four, six, ten years and decide to go back to school. You know, we have the benefits there for us uh, through this post-9-11. Some of us have other folk rehab training. Even some of the states offer, you know, different benefits. Illinois has the Illinois Veterans Grant. Uh, what I would say is, you know, explore. You're not going to know what you want to do immediately coming out of the military. You know, there are so many different options. You know, it took me a few tries to decide on what I actually wanted to focus on. You know, network. That's probably the biggest thing. Uh, knowing who to talk to, keeping those networks open, you know, communication. It's a really big uh, way to actually succeed in college and stay involved. A lot of us do have families, you know, people come out and get jobs, so school, you know, they have to juggle those aspects of their life, but, you know, staying involved is one way to stay focused. It keeps you driven, it keeps you motivated. Anything you learn in school, whether you think it's a, a generic, you know, just general degree, even a certificate program, whatever, um, you're going to learn something, you're going to pick up on things, you're going to help yourself, depending on how close it is to when you got out, you're going to help yourself um, acclimate, get back into the group of people, people who are a little bit younger, some people who are more familiar with veterans, um, kind of stepping stone to the getting back into the workforce. It's a great idea, um, the, the money, the fact that they're willing to pay for it, they pay you a monthly stipend, so you can you know live on your own and kind of be more independent than just, oh, I'm out of the military. I want to go to school, I go live with my parents. Well, anybody knows living with their parents might not be the easiest thing in the world, especially when you come from living on your own in the military or living with a group of people like you would in like a dormitory or whatever at school, and all of a sudden you're stuck with like just your parents. Um, it, it's different. So I would say going out on school, going back to school, branching out, um, taking what you learn from the military and try to pass it on to other people, you know, some hard work and some, some ethics goes a long way nowadays. I think it does transition from the military to Lewis uh, or to civilian life is made easier just because there's a great su a support staff here. Um, I get calls all the time asking how I'm doing and uh, there's definitely things that you can be involved in as far as military related or just being involved with other veterans and I think that's like a big deal for a lot of people that have you know served in the military is having other people that know what you've been through and have gone through the same things as you and it's uh, that in itself is is awesome. I don't know the, w the way that this school approaches veterans and, and is willing to to work for us whether I have questions you know I, I go to uh, Mr. Perry I believe he's still here um, you know if I have a question about oh man my I get a letter in the mail from from the GI Bill saying they're not going to cover something or I owe them money I go straight down there and I talk to him and he's available all the time. If a veteran is considering Lewis um, as a potential college, you don't need to think about it, just do it. Uh, Lewis is a great college, especially if you want to get into aviation, law enforcement, nursing. Um, I had the privilege of having some friends that have gone to Lewis, so they kind of put it in my head a little bit. But coming here, dealing with the, the veterans office, for veterans, this school does everything they can so that you can just focus on the schoolwork. When I came in here and applied, I thought it was gonna be this long drawn out process. And seriously, within 24 hours, it was done. And I was just you know, used to the military and how slow it works. Um, coming here, I was, like, I was dumbfounded because I was like, is there anything I need to do? Like, no. I would tell people that are looking to go to school after the military to check out Lewis, uh, for sure. It's probably the best decision I've made since I've gotten out, and uh, I've had nothing, I have no, no bad things to say about Lewis. It's been a great experience for me so far.